The IQ test. Um, I do hate individual IQ scores because I think they kind of... I hate pigeonhole somebody as average or not average. Mm. Because I, I think it's important to realise these tests only test what they test. They don't look at mm. inspiration, motivation, social ability. There's so much about a person which isn't being tested. However, for my purposes, the WISC, the Russia Intelligence Scales for Children, is extremely valuable, and particularly for the, for the um, type of children that I am seeing in an independent practice. It's fair. They're not culturally deprived, therefore they can manage the verbal questions. It's also a very good, it's, it, it's a good predictor of how well they ought to do. So actually it is, it's a very, I think it's a valid and reliable test to do. But I think one always has to be quite careful about how you interpret it. The child does well, you cannot possibly say that was a fluke. If they don't do very well, you can never say they could, they, oh, well, um, they can never do better than that. And although the test is very reliable, I mean, some children I've seen, you know, three, four times over 10, 12 year period, and their test scores on the IQ test will come up very similar on each occasion. I also know that children who are at a low F because they are really not doing well in school can come and really not do so well. When I looked at Fairley House, where many of the children who came from Sesma were having a tough time, their IQ score, but when I reassessed them as they left, they would very often have a higher score. And I think that was down to just them feeling better about mm. themselves and more willing to have a go. Mm. On both verbal and non-verbal together? Um, I'm, I'm kind of, maybe I'll generalise. Uh, I, I mean, when you know, you could kind of just get them a better score. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's so interesting. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the test, there are ten tests which I use. Three of them are verbal. Three of them are to do with perceptual reasoning, two of them are to do with working memory, and two of them are processing speed. Um, and when you put, you put all the scores together to get an overall IQ, uh, but sometimes if the performance is very diverse, um, I much rather focus on how they've done in these four different domains. So the three verbal tests that they do are similarities, comprehension and vocabulary. On the similarities they are asked, how are these things similar? What, in what way are, are they alike? Red and blue, their colours. An apple and banana, their fruit. And mainly children latch on quite quickly and it gets more difficult and you go on to um, uh, autumn and winter. And it is interesting with ones like that, you do notice the children who are like months, days, Oh, I know what it is, but I can't tell you. And it's, so on that one, you, you're wanting a precise answer and you pick up on the children who are, it's on the tip of their tongue and they just can't get it. But those, I also love it because with the, 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 um, some of the, the tests are quite challenging when you get to things like revenge and forgiveness <laughs> or permission and limitation. And I always think these children are so nice. They sit in front of me yes. and I ask these completely mad questions. And they don't ever say, why do you want to do this all day? And they sit there and dutifully produce an answer. And some of them are very creative. So the seven narratives is, is basically about reasoning and it's not something they're often asked to do. So you really are seeing not what they've been taught, but how, how quick they are to make connections. Vocabulary, they're asked to give word definitions, and again, that does pick up on children who have difficulty explaining themselves, because you can pick up one. I'm not looking at their language, I'm scoring them for the correctness of their answer, and I don't actually care how they say it, but I am aware if their grammar is very scrambled, because you might then suggest that they see a speech and language therapist. Uh, but it's, it's also interesting, because you know where people have been holidays, when they have to give definitions, but you know, you give ancient... Pest. I always like it when you get the ones who say, well, there are two forms of pest, you know. <laughs> and then island. And it's like, you know who's been to a tropical island recently. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those places you fly to. It has farm trees. Um, so the cavalry uh, also is interesting because very often children who don't read very much after a certain stage, their vocabularies are much further down. Mm -hmm. Reading does make a big difference. Mm -hmm. 
And then there's comprehension, which they have to give longer explanations. And again, it's this set of questions which hop from one topic to another, like um, why do cars have seatbelts? Why is it important for the police to wear a uniform? Can you get some wonderful answers to that? You know, so they know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, the, so the burglar can run away. <laughs> And that, again, goes up to much more complicated things like why is freedom of speech important in a democracy? And every now and then you've got a nine or ten-year-old who will give you a very good stab at that. And uh, you're kind of like, wow. Because these are not things that any of these taught, but it's really information they have picked up from the world around them. And if they've absorbed information, I'm sure some families are more discursive at meal times than others, but it's always fascinating the ones who've picked up information and can and then can put it into my, the context of working with me and produce a good answer. So that's the three verbal. Then we go on to, are you all right? Are we all right for time? Yeah. Um, the non-verbal. And the three tests here, one is called block design. And I give them uh, some red and white cubes that they have two red sides, side, two sides are red, two sides are white, and two sides are half red and half white. And they have to match these these cubes to some 2D patterns that they see on you know on the page. And again, what's interesting here is that um, children who have difficulty with block design very often have difficulty with maths. And I think that's very much to do maths can very often feel almost tangible, can't it? You you can kind of when you're thinking of a problem, you it's it's difficult to describe, but it's 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 almost spatial, isn't it? Mm. And also, a lot of maths is to do with patterning and repetition. And it's fascinating because not only is it interesting to see which children drop the bricks on the floor and, and really have difficulty, they put it the right way and then they knock it over. Mm -hmm. So it, the hand con control mm -hmm. is very evident there if they're having difficulties. Um, but sometimes just they haven't a clue about, about top, bottom, left, right orientation, how to how to, in, in their mind's eye, cut up the visual pattern and then reconstruct it. Is the 2D in front of the vertical, or is it flat? It's flat. flat. Yeah, it's flat. flat. And um, then the next oh, one... Yeah. How many blocks do they have to... They start off with four, okay. and then they go on to nine. So the first one is one, two, three, four, mm -hmm. and then it's three rows of three. I'd be rubbish at that. Yeah. I'd be going like that, mm -hmm. you know, trying to match that. <laughs> so I can go. Mm -hmm. appreciate that. Um, I'm sure practice does help, but I mean, it's also the children who say, oh, I've done this, lots of this, then yes, they, they're fine to begin with, and then the moment they uh, get to somewhere below the level they ought to be, they have problems. Um, can I, sorry, yeah. is this something you can train a child to do if you bought games that were... Yes, and I think one of the things you can absolutely do is for a child who doesn't kind of see in their mind's eye, you can talk them through. One of the things helpful with that is, is particularly if they're good on language, is actually give them a language. What, what mm. cube do you think is at the mm. top right? Have you ever came, come across Mosey blocks? No. no. Yeah. They are fun. Yeah. Have you asked yeah. yeah. they, them? They are um, a set of, of blocks and they are designed so you attach language and you're very systematic. I, I won't go on about Mosey blocks, yeah. so they are, you could do an hour yeah. on yeah. blocks, yeah. but yeah. they are absolutely terrific for teaching children to attach language to spatial, to spatial things. Yes, they're yeah. fantastic. Yeah. And children absolutely love those. I mean, I've got grandchildren yeah. that plead to use those. Absolutely. Yeah. The picture on the top, which is yeah. Yeah. Done. was done by one of the children. Yeah. The one with the wow. black and white it, But it's just what they have to be completely yeah. systematic. They're not allowed to rush at this. They mm. have to look at the picture. They have to analyse it. How many cubes do you need that yeah. are red and black? Right. How many have got a curl on the corner? I won't go on about the middle. You teach them by talking through. Yes, through. so talking yeah. through is good. Mm -hmm. um, oh, right. Then uh, they mm -hmm. do picture concepts. And so quite often, the child that can't do the block design, Finds they can do a non-verbal task when it's just to do with pictures. Mm. And here they see initially two rows of pictures, and they have to they have to pick one picture from the top line to match it with one picture from the bottom line. So in the first example, there's a tree on the top and a tree at the bottom. But those um, the links between the pictures get more and more obscure, and then they go on and they actually have three lines. So you have to pick a picture from each, one picture from each line has a linking concept.
So it might be, for example, on the top you might have a hose pipe and then in the middle um, a kitchen sink and then on the bottom a kettle with steam coming out of it. And they, that's all to do with water. But that's interesting because once you get three lines, there might be a bowl of fruit on the bottom line, and there might be a, a cherries on the bottom line, and a banana on the middle line, and the impulsive children go, oh, cherries, what Oh, uh, well, there's a comb on the top line. You could be brushing your hair while you eat mm -hmm. and, and look, finish, go on, let's do the next one. And other children are very persistent, and they see this doesn't make sense, and they go back and they'll work it out again. And the third nonverbal is called matrices, and it's again uh, logic logical deduction, you're, you're completing a, a, a pattern, with, you're given several options, but uh, I, I, I should have brought some pictures, but I haven't. But anyway, children then have to, to try out different variables in their mind, and it really is seeing how, how well can they make, can they problem solve and, and deduce. Um, and what I find is that if Children, some children are good at all three of them, or bad at all three, but very often if you get a child who's bad on block design, very good on pictures, there'll be some in the middle with the matrices because it's, it's partly pictures and partly um, designs and shapes. And then the next important bit is working memory. And really, as I'm sure all of you teachers are so aware, that children who've got difficulties in the classroom so often have incredibly poor working memory. And a huge amount of work has been done really recently. There's some very good books that have come out. Mm. Susan Gallagher, which is also, uh, yeah, done a very, very good book on working memory. Working memory is a bit like the mental whiteboard. And when you're talking about auditory memory, it short term working memory is it's what you can remember in the very short term. So therefore, um, if a child has a poor working memory, they are going to forget what they've just heard much more quickly than a child with a good working memory. So if a child with a poor working memory has the teacher saying, now children, get out the blue book from under your desk, put it on the top, do the date on the right, do the, the title in the middle, do the margin, turn it upside down, and then start. They won't know if they can... We all have the average working memory length for an adult is seven, give or take two. Children's working memory, the amount they can hold in working memory, get, develops as they get older. But if you, you're, you, you, as I said, it's like a mental whiteboard, and if you are distracting while you're trying to remember, or indeed overloaded, you just can't remember anything. So it's those children who really need very careful classroom environment where they are sitting where they can ask if they haven't heard or haven't taken. It's not they don't hear, it's they're not taking it in. Um, or, and if you are teaching, actually saying things in, in bite sizes or making sure that your sentence construction is very simple so they don't have to wait till the end of a complicated sentence before knowing what it was they were meant to be doing. But to measure the working memory, I have them repeat numbers. I like, so you start off by saying, now I'm going to say some numbers and I want you to say them after me. Seven, five, four. Then they say it. And you give them a trial, a trial of two on each occasion. So they have two lots of three numbers and then two lots of four numbers and then five and then six if they've managed to do that. And then you say, now we're going to do it, and do it in reverse order. I'd like you to do it backwards. One day, John, God, I'm so, and then some of them know they haven't got a good work and they say, oh no, I can't do that. But some of those children who can manage the digits forwards have an absolute disaster on digits backwards. And you really know then it's that although they can, they can hear it and take it in if it's just an ordinary sequence, the minute they have to hold something in their mind, while manipulating it or working on it, then they're in trouble. For example, mental arithmetic. You've got to hold on to several facts before you do the sum. And indeed, the other test that forms part of working memory is, mental, is arithmetic. And maths problems are read to them in, in word form. So they are, and there are math problems which are things like 
Mary owns 30 pounds. She spends half of it. Magazines cost five pounds each. How many magazines can Mary buy? Um, and it's very interesting because actually some children who know they are good at maths and it is the one thing they are good at but don't have a good working memory will kill themselves to do well on this test. And I, I still don't quite get it. Um, but, but very often the children with poor working memory uh, what happens is I read the question, start my stopwatch, they've got 30 seconds to do it, and very often they'll say, could you say that again? Mm -hmm. um, and then once you've said it the second time and they know what they're watching out for, they can sometimes, if they're good at maths, get it very quickly. But it, I try and always make a note of what, the ones that need things repeated. And also, it is interesting because some, some of them are incredibly simple and really boring, and mm -hmm. there are things like there are six cows in the field three cows leave, four more cows come in, how many are there now? And these 12-year-olds who, you know, if you said, uh, you know, six, uh, whatever, take away whatever, they'd have done it quickly, are still making the wrong answer because they just can't hold on to the information. So that's working memory. And then the final section is processing speed. And here it's um, a paper and pencil test. And the first one, they have one, the numbers one to nine written in a line at the top, and underneath there are certain shapes. And so each, each number has a shape attached to it, and they then have two minutes to um, fill in the boxes below um, some lines and numbers, and they have to look up, find it, put it down, put it in. So if you have difficulty looking up and focusing and then transferring the information down, mm. or indeed if your hand-eye coordination is mm. poor, or indeed if your concentration is poor, you don't do well. Mm. And it's my job to try and work at which of those three things is the problem. Mm. Um, because again, children with attention difficulties will do five and then... <laughs> Where was I? And they really don't know they've just taken a nice break. Um, so the second um, test I use is something called symbol search, and that's rather similar. It's it's trying to you're looking across the page to identify whether a symbol on the left is actually uh, being repeated on the other side of the page. So those are the tests, and it, the the numbers. I suppose the important thing is the interpretation of them. What tends to happen is, um, I think if you had, had someone who had no particular strengths and no particular difficulties, they would get a very even profile. They would, they would just get all their scores to be around the same thing. There's some particular tests, they, they get turned into something called a scaled score. And again, you know how the child is done relative to its peer group, and indeed, you know, you can compare them with a child older but they are compared within that age group. The scores go from 1 to 19, and it's, it's very unusual to get a, a 1, and it's pretty unusual to get a 19. And occasionally I get children who get under verbal 19, 19, 19, and it's, going, it's just like being in a room with something different. It's, it's really fun. <laughs> when the odd child person or young person or child emerges who is super bright. Um, but it's not, not often. But um, so when I say the scores would be even, you know, if every was, if somebody was absolutely average and didn't have strengths and difficulties, you would expect them to score ten on each one. What tends to happen with the population of children that I have um, seen is um, very often the verbal is quite good. Um, let's if they let's take a kind of typically dyslexic profile. There is no reason why the verbal shouldn't be quite good except the vocabulary might be a little bit down if their peer group have been reading for a while, depending on their age and what they've missed out on. Um, the non-verbal, there's no reason why that shouldn't be absolutely fine. The working memory will be down. And someone's uh, processing speed can be fine as well. And that would be more likely to be your, your mildest. Um, it's, the thing is, it's, it is to do with everything and all the other elements I've talked about earlier. So you're, you're trying to interpret the results really within the context of everything else that you found out. Um, so basically, yes, the dyslexic will have a poor working memory and, you know, the problems with word finding and rote learning information. The child who is dyspraxic is likely to have problems with the block design and the coding. They might do very well on the verbal, 
and on the non-verbal except block design, they might have a perfectly good working memory, but um, they might have difficulty with coding. And so, and then there are children who do very well on both the, the think, in a sense, the verbal tests and the perceptual reasoning are both more to do with just pure intellect. It, you know, how quick are you? How quickly do you make connections? The working memory and the processing speed are how you process incoming information. And so sometimes when you get children who are high on thinking, but their information processing is low, you know they can't demonstrate what they understand in the classroom. They don't take things in very easily. And if they're slow on the hand-eye stuff, they're very often those children who've got appalling handwriting as well. They may not be dyspraxic, but they, they can't get it down. And you kind of feel that life is very frustrating for those children. They don't have the kind of information processing skills that they need within a work situation. And so, anyhow, that's, I thought I could go on forever. <laughs> um, gosh, so I've way over, gone over time. So after that, um, I see parents and I give them feedback and we, they clarify what they want to get out of the assessment. I give them feedback of what the child's done. Hopefully we all say, they say, yeah, that's the child we know. Mm. Yes, you've got it. And I'm like, yeah. Um, and then the main thing then is saying, well, what next? And that can be anything from, look, you need a speech and language therapist, you need an occupation therapist, you need to take them to a special school, or you need to just a little bit of fine tuning. And then they get a report. And then I'm perfectly being told they don't understand it, which is not a blank, because <laughs> I like to think that I and my associates do write in reasonably plain English. But I think the main thing is, with those test results, the, the scores are not, very, it doesn't really matter if they understand the scores or not, it's actually implications. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, you as teachers are pretty good on understanding what the scores mean and can also help them with it. So that's it. <laughs> well done. Thank you.